Everybody, it's Jim from Sprague Wood Turning. If you've been around for a while, you know that things don't always go to plan on my channel. And in this video, you might say that things get a little explosive. Stick around to see what happens. So this week, what we have here is a very large maple burl. This is a commission for Daryl, and Daryl wants turquoise color resin in it. So that's what we're going to do. This is the new one from Designer Epoxy. Um, the, what's going to make this really unique is the fact that he wants this an inch and a half to an inch and a quarter thick. So I really like thick, heavy turnings like that. And I've made a number of them over the years and they don't stick around very long. So it's good to see that there's others in the world that are like me. They like just kind of a big, heavy, massive turning that's really colorful. So um, the only issue is that I want to maximize the size of this. And this is sitting at about 14 and 3 quarters. Inside my pressure pot will do about... 14 and a half but it's it, you know that's the maximum size so what I think I'm going to do is take this down to 14 inches in diameter and we'll put two sheets of six mil poly down inside of the pressure pot and then we'll cast directly into that and hopefully we don't have any leaks so first things first I should show you the side of this it's got a really deep resin pocket as well but the 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 figure in this is amazing. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get, you know, one or two cores out of the center of this, so we'll be able to save those. Uh, so first things first, let's get this rounded on the bandsaw, and then I will clean up all the bark areas and we'll get to casting. First of all, I'd like to thank those who stopped by to watch my videos. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and for the new people that may be watching, if you're wondering why I'm talking, it's because the majority of my subscribers want this. They want voiceovers, so I typically will do a voiceover on all of my projects that you'll see here on YouTube. Well, my recent projects anyway. So anyway, if you're new, welcome aboard. And to those loyal subscribers that I have, welcome back. Now once we get this rounded so it fits properly in the pressure pot, you'll see me bring it over to the lathe. And I put it between centers. I just figured that it would be easier just to put it between centers and get rid of all this bark. And, you know, for, for the new people that are new to resin casting, this bark has got to go. If you leave that bark in place and then you proceed to cast, you're probably going to have some adhesion issues. And along with that, if that bark stays in place when you go to sand, the bark is always going to be softer than the surrounding wood. And then when you rub your hand across the surface, you'll feel dig-ins. So that's why it's preferred, well it's not preferred, you really need to remove this bark or you know you're just going to have issues. So you know I like to use a flat tip screwdriver instead of a, a chisel when I'm doing this. You tend to get less dig-ins and it tends to cut the surface up less. You'll see me use a brass brush mounted in a drill, a sanding mop, compressed air, just to get rid of all of that stuff prior to casting. And the other thing is you, you got to really clean these out or else you can get some floaty bits in your resin casting, which nobody wants. I'm going to be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy again this week. This is, I can't remember how deep this was, uh, five inches, I think. So you really need a deep casting epoxy if you're going to attempt to do something like this. There's the turquoise blue, another hit from Designer Epoxy. It's up there with Blue Lagoon as far as what I like. Uh, but you know, you can't really go wrong with Caribbean colors now, can you? So here's my latest greatest plan as far as getting the largest return out of your pressure pot. So those are two garbage bags, which will give us four layers of plastic of protection between the pressure pot walls and the casting. So as you see me prep this casting, uh, the main plan here was to be able to pull those pieces of bucket material that you see going in there out after the casting is cured. And then after that, simply just grab the pieces of plastic and pull it up and lift it out of the pressure pot. That's the plan, and it's still in place as it, as it is now. 
but we'll see uh, what changes later on. There, that should keep the garbage bag from encroaching into the resin area. This is probably going to take three of these buckets, I'm assuming. <laughs> Maybe even more. Um, yeah. I wonder if it's going to work. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only thing. Uh, I've sprayed mold release in here, in behind the plastic. So if there is a leak, hopefully any of the resin will come out easy, including this piece if it's jammed in there. Uh, but I mean, there's four pieces of plastic between it and the pressure pot, so it should work. What you didn't really see uh, prior to getting to this point is that this piece was, there had to be a thousand cracks in this and voids. So it took a lot of resin. Yeah, I would say it's going to take three for sure. And here's another liter and a half. All right, so that's four and a half liters of resin. Uh, what I think I'll do is I'll pressurize this. I'll check on it in about an hour to see if the level has dropped off. And then I will top it up again. And then that's it. We'll see you guys in three days. So it's been four days and um, I just removed Dwayne off the top and it's loose in here. It's not stuck to the to the pressure pot, so that's good. Problem is there's just a lot of suction there. So I'm gonna bring the pressure pot inside the workshop and we'll get it out a different way. That is pretty heavy. So at this point, I'm very positive that we're not going to really have any issues. Uh, I am finding that now it's getting more stuck as it gets out near the top. The casting is free, though. It's moving back and forth. And my idea of being able to pull the bucket material out of there, well, that was just, well, that was crazy. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking when I was thinking I'd be able to pull that out of there. For some reason, I just thought that it would break apart from the casting and it wasn't going to be an issue like it was. So now I'm like, hmm, I know that it's not stuck in the pressure pot and I know that I'm going to be able to get it out. So I'm trying different things and there's, there's a little tie down. So I said, okay, I'm going to put the tie down on the top of the casting and, and take it over to my garage door tracking and hang it from there with a come along. And, you know, as I'm putting the tie down in, don't I snap off a couple of screws? I kind of figured it was going to go that way. So here it's suspended from, like I said, the tracking. And, you know, I'm just giving it some lap, some, you know, love taps. And it, it's coming out, but it's, you know, it seems to really slow down to the point where maybe if I had left it overnight, it may have come out on its own. But, of course, who's got that kind of time? So then I get this idea, I'm just going to, I was having the compressed air, I couldn't get it down to the bottom of the casting. So I drilled a hole using compressed air, and you know, I start to see some success. Now, over this last couple of years, there's been a lot of people comment, say, oh, you should be using uh, compressed air to get your castings out. And in one, one occasion, I drilled a hole in the bottom of a plastic uh, bucket, and when we pressurized it, you know, the, the bottom of it exploded. So, you know, there's some danger. There's a lot of danger when you're working with compressed air. As a former mechanic, I can tell you that for sure. So, you know, patience is probably one of the things that at times I don't have enough of. So I said, you know, I'm going to keep giving it some compressed air. And as you can see, it, it's coming. So, you know, I'm very hopeful here. So if you start real easy, be prepared because there is going to be quite a kick come out of this here. So I don't want to start on anybody. Be prepared. Oh. 
You okay? <laughs> Whoo! Holy, did that come flying out of there. I was worried it was going to do that. <sighs> well, at least it's out. For the record, I knew that this was going to come out with a little bit of force. I didn't think it was going to come out with that much force. If you're using compressed air to extract your castings, be really, really careful because you could be seriously hurt. I was lucky that nothing got damaged. The casting didn't get, ca didn't get damaged. I didn't. None of my equipment was hurt. But you certainly could have been. And if you look, <laughs> if you look at my posture, as it's coming out near the top, I kind of lean away from it because I feel that something bad is about to happen. Now, I figured that when it did come out, it was just going to be a little pop and, you know, there'd be no harm, no foul. But um, that just goes to show you that working with compressed air can be very dangerous. Well... We've got a good solid casting by the looks of it. There's no thermal cracking. Don't see any bubbles. Should be pretty nice inside. So the thing is with this, this probably needs to sit another day. I left this at about 60 degrees uh, for two days because there's a lot of resin here and I didn't want it to thermal crack. So I'm gonna put this back in a clean room where there's heat and we'll see you guys tomorrow. So now that we know the wrong way to do this method, I will use this method again in the future, but I'll do it the right way. And what I will do next time is I will put bucket material between the plastic and the pressure pot wall. As long as that bucket material goes all the way down to the bottom of the pressure pot, then you should be able to pull that plastic bucket material out and then lift the casting out of there. That's in theory. We'll find out. So now that the big show's over, <laughs> uh, we've got mounted between centers and here I'm using the Hercules. This is the number three. Uh, it does have a relatively new cutter on it, so it's actually cutting really, really nice. Push cuts, pull cuts. Uh, I know which, what's going to be up and what's going to be down. So I'm just removing the bulk of the resin that you can see that was jammed between the plastic bucket material. I think one of the reasons why it was so hard to get that bucket material out of there was because it was doubled up in some spots and the resin was between them. And the fact that the resin wasn't fully cured, it was really quite sticky. So the resin had a real good grip on that plastic material, and there's no way that it was going to let it go. Now, I never thought about this until afterwards, but probably the biggest reason why I wasn't able to get this out is because the pressure pot was in my clean room, which has heat in it. So it was set at 75 or 80 degrees, and I have it set at that so that the, the resins will cure. Now I took that pressure pot out of its warm environment and brought it into my workshop and I've got a wood stove in my workshop but it really hadn't kicked in yet so it was still quite cold in my workshop. That would have caused the pressure pot to contract and that's probably the biggest reason why this casting come out so hard. So I believe that you know, if I hadn't been doing this inside of my clean room where the heat was, that this casting would have come out a lot easier and I probably wouldn't have needed to use compressed air at all. But you know, at the time, I wasn't really thinking that it was going to be a thing, but it certainly was. So 
So this is the bottom of the casting and there's a lot of resin on the bottom because the bottom of the pressure pot isn't actually flat. Something that I overlooked, I would maybe put down a bed of rice to limit how much resin is sitting down there before the plastic goes in. That certainly would help. And so anyway, uh, the plan is to actually get at least a core out of this. Now that I've got those busted off screws in, in one of them, it, you know, I only end up getting one of them, but you know, at least we do get a second core out of this. So here I'm just cleaning off the bottom, getting it, basically prepping it, getting it ready for the glue block because I don't really want to turn a tenon on this and take away from the height of it. So that's why I'm using a glue block. Since this was going to be a fairly large beefy turning, I wanted to make sure that I had a, a fairly large foot on here. So we're not we're not following the the one third rule. And again, if I'll cover this, if you're not familiar with that, basically the foot of your bowl should be one third the size of the diameter of the bowl. They say that's for aesthetics, but when you're dealing with something like this that's very unique, I don't really follow that rule all that often. Now we're on the top of the casting and what I want to do here is turn a tenon so that I can grab it with the, the chuck. That way, uh, you know, it's being held when we're putting the, the glue block on the very bottom of this. Uh, sometimes you, you need to be an octopus to do that. So I prefer to turn a tenon and then just hold it with the chuck and then that way it frees up your hands to put the glue block on there properly. One of the things that I really don't like about resin turning is these shavings that get wrapped around your spindle or your chuck or whatever. Uh, once you get down to an area like that where the resin and wood are a combination, then you know they, they just break apart and they don't get wrapped around stuff. But when you get out near the rim like I am there, you'll see all kinds of it. It's, and it's tough stuff. <laughs> it's not easy to actually get off there so it wraps around there and it slaps your hands and you know nobody wants that just cleaning up that tenon with the parting tool now i've got it mounted in the chuck and we're getting ready to clean up the very bottom here before the glue block goes on i do like to keep tailstock support in place until you know pretty much the last moment and when it's in this configuration i actually take some pretty light cuts and the last thing is take some 60 grit, roughen up the surface to make sure that we've got good adhesion because this is a very heavy casting and uh, you're going to be relying, there, look, don't spare the glue, people, don't spare the glue. Once the glue was set, I think I let it set for about 15 minutes, then I trimmed up the, the tenon so that we can reverse it and get to coring. We are all set up for coring. This is the one-way system. I have my number two knife set in, and of course my Core Pro cutter. It should eat this stuff up like butter. Good thing about the size of this, I'm able to use tailstock support, so that's awesome. We're not gonna get a real deep piece out of here, maybe 
two and a half, two and a quarter inches deep because I've got it set at an inch and a half in thickness. All right, let's see how we do and watch the corporal cutter eat this stuff up. If you're using the one-way coring system, I do highly recommend this cutter. It is the replacement cutter for the one-way coring system. It has replaceable carbide tips, and I've been using the same one now for quite some time now. I, I don't know how many cores are on this. If I had to guess, I would say that there's probably 70, core, 70 cores on this cutter, which you'd be hard-pressed to do with the original cutter that came with this setup. One Way makes fantastic tools. I love One Way products, but you know this cutter. I don't think there's there's any there's no replacement for it. This thing's awesome. And uh, so anyway, there is a link in the description to get to Hunter Tools and use code Inlay Gym at checkout, and you'll be able to get yourself one of these along with any of the other tools that you've seen here from Hunter Tools. Since this bowl is thicker than I ordinarily would make the base of the rig is pulled out from the headstock. I'm using the number two knife and I don't want this thing to go flying across the workshop. So I I actually had to come past center in order to cut this relatively clean. I, I don't like to cut them right off because of course they can come out and go flying across the room and nobody wants that. But I did have to come past center in order to get to a point where I could break the core free. So that's two or three attempts now. I think I get it here. Nope. One more time. Well past center, actually. So there's our core free. Uh, as you can see, a little tiny piece of wood can be quite stubborn. So what I did was I took it over on my belt sander and just ground away a little flat area and now I'm using the large outside bowl as basically a drive center and I've got the core as you can see mounted in the center of it and I've just got my thumb and my index finger together and I'm rubbing it around the top surface of the bowl and I know that if it feels even on the end of my finger then I know that things will be basically centered and I'm just using the Hercules here to make a tenon, we still have the screws in that top part, so we got, I'm gonna stick this back on the lathe and core out the very center of that to get rid of that. And Daryl actually wants this bowl blank the way it is because I think he wants to try his hand at finishing it. So that's great. Thought I would show this. So deep down inside of this casting, there's, you know, some cracks and voids, pretty much unavoidable. Uh, there was a ton of them in this blank, so I hopefully will be able to turn away the majority of these. And if not, we'll, uh, we'll either use some UV resin or I might just use some clear CA. We'll have to see. Thought I'd show it to you though. I now have the piece mounted outboard, so since it's, you know it's mounted on a new chuck again, you're going to have to just true things up. Very light trimming here, not a whole lot to be done in order to uh, true things up. This piece I could only turn, I believe, at 255 RPM. It was so heavy and anything above that, the lathe would have shook too badly. So I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I actually was taking some really fine cuts on the outside, and those are finishing cuts. If I'm hogging out wood like I am here in the center, I'm taking just as big a bite as basically my lathe and the tool can, can stand. That push cut there is actually one of the more aggressive cuts with this tool. 
and just get it down to your you know your your thickness that you want and then you can go back and take those really fine trimming cuts that will get rid of any chip out in the resin and any tear out that you'll see in the wood itself So those I would classify as being finishing cuts. Uh, typically they're long sweeping cuts, not so much like that. We are going to have to do some filling on this. So, you know, I'm just trying to improve the surface reasonably well before we actually do any filling. Uh, that would just, I don't know, it, it, I find it's easier to find where the cracks are if you need to fill in any cracks and voids. So that's why I like to do it that way. Thanks to those who watched the butternut wall hanging video last week. Uh, I thought that it was one of the more cooler things that I had made, but I was quite surprised at how a lot of people didn't care for it. It was either they didn't like the resin or the butternut or the purpose of the wall hanging. There was a lot of people that commented saying uh, it should have been a clock. And you know what? Maybe it definitely would be a really nice clock. But you know, I, I want it to stay more on the artistic side of it and not so much on the functional side of it. Anyway, please share your thoughts. Uh, and if you missed that video, I will put a link at the end of this video so you can watch it. What do you think? I think she's a beauty. So there are a few cracks and voids to fill. Uh, this is the worst one we've had in a while and you know the epoxy can't get to the middle of a blank when it's sealed off so that's what all these little cracks and voids are now I'm going to use medium CA and the reason for that is because these may be fairly deep and if I use UV resin I don't know if I'm going to be able to cure it so I'll use the CA glue I don't know where my small bottles went to, but I'll have to put it in a thin bottle. And then we'll throw some pigment in it and start filling these. One of the main reasons why I use the medium this week, and you'll, you'll actually see me use the thin here in a little bit too. I find that when you add the pigment to the medium, that it tends to uh, blend better. The other bonus is it doesn't cure as fast as the thin stuff does. So, you know, you can lay it on the surface, keep shaking the bottle, making sure that, you know, the, those pigments are suspended in, in that CA glue. And then what I find really effective when you're using the medium is to just take your glove and make sure you have gloves on when you're doing it, and just rub your hands all over the surface of the wood. And that will encourage that to go deep into those cracks and all those little voids. So, you know, it, it, I think it's it's the best way to go when you're dealing with a casting like this. Larger areas, the UV resin would certainly be the better option. There, right, those all look filled up pretty good. I got to tilt it on its side and do them on the side. I'm just gonna hit it with the accelerator and then I can do that. This is actually a bottle of thin, so I'm going to use that on the very fine cracks. One of the knocks on the thin over the medium is when you use the accelerator, if you spray it from distance, it tends to not foam as much, but it still can. And you'll see it here on the rim. When I put that thin CA glue on there and then hit it with the accelerator, you can see all that foaming action. It's important to use the thin to seal up those deep cracks because, you know, the medium may do it, but 
I know that the thin will for sure. So I'll always use the thin to use the uh, to seal up these cracks. And on occasion, I will tint that as well and use it just like I did as a medium. There, I think that's pretty much got the majority of them. You're not going to get them all. Uh, we'll give this a trimming tomorrow, and then we will uh, hopefully get to our first coat of finish after some sanding. All right, that's it. See you tomorrow. This is, in fact, the next day, and all I'm doing is trimming the surface, getting it ready for sanding. You definitely want to get rid of all that CA glue because uh, it will eat up your sandpaper pretty good. So, you know, once you get this trimmed up, you're probably okay to go to sanding. Have a look at the surface, and if there's any really major areas that still need some filling, fill those again, and then trim, and then you can proceed to sanding. Finally on to sanding. These are the three and a half inch dipple discs from sandpaper.ca. And I've been asked to show this in real time to give you a sense of how fast I'm going. Uh, the drill that I have, it will do 2400 RPM. This one I think is dropping off because I believe the brushes are wearing out of it, but it's still going probably at least 2000 RPM. And delay the set at 255 because I can't go any higher than that. Ordinarily, I would have the lathe at about 1200. And I personally find that that's the, the best sanding speeds to get a good surface with. So forward and reverse uh, with each grit, and then you should have a really good surface. So this was sanded up to 320, and then I stopped the lathe and proceeded to do more filling. It doesn't matter how well your filling is, you're going to have to deal with it. <laughs> uh, with the amount of cracks that was in this piece, I knew that I was gonna to have to do more of it later on. So there you can see, <laughs> there's more of it after it being filled. So again, grind that. I don't tool this at this point. I just sand it back with the 320 and then proceed to 800 until, we're, um, until you've got a good surface. This is the Triple E buffing compound from the Be All Buffing System, and it's just used after 800 to take any fine little scratches out of the resin. I'm not so concerned about the wood. It's the resin that I want to really get pristine before we can put our first coat of finish on. And the last thing I do is use some denatured alcohol to clean away all that buffing compound. And then we can get a first coat of finish on this beauty. Like I say, best part, first coat finish, this is Waterlux Original Gloss. There you go. I tell you, it has got some wheat to it. I realize the chalk is still on there, but man, this thing is heavy. I'll get a weight on it before the end of the video here. Crazy resin. Crazy looking burl. Tons of filling with the CA glue, but well worth it. Awesome. See you tomorrow for the second coat. Figured I would get my larger bar of Triple E buffing compound. <laughs> so that's that's what that is. It's still the same thing. And again, I use this between coats to level the finish, take any crud out of the finish that may have settled in it while it was curing. And um, I don't know. I You can use maybe a 4-0 steel wool or a 6-0 steel wool. But I do find that this method is probably the best way to do it, especially with the water looks. And of course, cleaning up with a denatured alcohol. Good morning. This is the second coat of Waterlux Gloss. Do 
two might do it. Anyway, if there is a third, I will do it the same as I did this coat. And we'll see you when we're doing the bottom. This thing's got to be 20 pounds. It is heavy. That's what it looks like after the third coat. Time to use the vacuum chuck. It's funny, I put it on the first time and I almost got it perfect, which is pretty rare. <laughs> Usually it takes three or four attempts before you can really even get it close. So I just used the uh, the bowl goucher from David Ellsworth. Took my time, whittled away this maple waste block. And a lot of people may be wondering why I'm using maple. And the reason I'm using, use hardwoods for your waste blocks because if you use any soft woods, they're just not strong enough. And especially on a piece with this kind of weight, you definitely want to be using a hardwood. That way you don't have things going flying across the workshop. Since there was no resin on the bottom of this, I figured that all I needed to do was sand it to 320, so that's what I did. All right, let's have a last little chat about this beautiful bowl. What do you think about this hefty gem? I absolutely love this bowl i wish it was mine it would go into my personal collection if it was mine the um the really cool thing about having this thick rim is that these look like islands and the burl tapers away like this under the surface so you can see the color variation like you would on an on an island if you're looking down on it so that's really cool this piece i know that he wanted this an inch and a quarter I left that at an inch and a half and I was a little worried about losing that detail if you had gone in there and taken more of that away. So I haven't talked to him about that, I haven't told him yet, <laughs> but uh, hopefully he's okay with it. Here is the very bottom. It is so busy that I don't even know if you're going to be able to see the details that are on there, but they are on there. And there's one coat of finish as well, so that will take two more coats of finish. Uh, the uh, This burl is busy. It is so busy, the, the, the chatoyance in it, all the cracks and voids. I mean, it's just crazy, crazy busy. This piece ended up being 13 and a half by, 13, a little more than 13 and a half by four and a half tall. And I noticed this morning that there's a little ring of finish around the outside on the very top. So I'll have to redo that, but other than that, once the bottom's done, it will be ready to go to its new home. And I hope that Daryl and his family really like this bowl. I'm going to set this down. Because it's heavy. So the scale that I have out here in the workshop will only go 10 pounds. And I set that on there and it maxed it out right away. So that, that I'm, it's probably between 12 and 15 pounds. It is heavy, heavy, heavy. And with a chuck on it, it easily was 20 pounds to try and hold that to show it in the camera was actually oh well, this is pretty heavy <laughs> but uh very cool we will see more turnings like this in the future and if you're if you're worried about making wood turnings like this and not selling i think you'd be surprised try try a few of them that are really thick like this i actually had one that was probably twice that thickness and i just took out a little dish in the very middle of it and then that was it and you know it was funny i went to this craft show and and I, my wife looked. My wife looked at it, and I remember this. She looks. She goes, "Well, nobody's going to buy that." And it was the first thing that sold in my booth when I was at a show. So it just goes to show you that you know we're we're all different, and we all like different things. It's a good thing because it'd be pretty boring if we all like the same thing. Uh, okay, what else? Three coats of the Waterlux gloss on that, and uh, yeah. Totally fun. Thanks, Daryl, for bringing that barrel, bringing that burl by, so that we could finish this and have a look at it because it's really, really cool. Don't forget to put designer epoxy in the comments down below to be entered into the three-gallon kit at ninety thousand. Of course, that's Canada and the lower forty-eight U.S. states only. Uh, next week is going to be—I don't even really know what it's going to be. It's cast. It's ready to go. I don't want to give it away, but. I'll just say that it involves some squirrels and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, well, that's it. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Please leave a comment down below. And of course, if you need anything from my sponsors, go down to the description and get some 
get some discount codes and put some money back in your pocket. All right, well, that's it. Take care, stay safe, don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. And of course, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. A thumbs up helps too. See you next week.